See, before you were a man who had lived for centuries, kept alive by the blood of innocent people. When the full moon rises, I turn into a werewolf with only one desire, to kill. I tried to perform the miracle of science and failed. My blood is contaminated with the blood of Dracula. Pretty Yvonne Lime lives on the screen these dramatic and important events in every young girl's life. Her first sincere kiss. I don't want my girl messing around with those creeps. Her first grown-up giving of love. Her joining of a secret society. <laughs> what a hell cat she's going to make. <laughs> The Hellcats are the Hellraisers in every high school, determined to be different, daring, defiant, dedicated to doing well, all the wrong things. Did you ever steal? No. You'll learn. If you're gonna ditch me on a Saturday night, you can spend a whole day with your Hellcats. You know how to reach me when you want to apologize. On the Connie Harris case, you asked me to call. Well, I'm afraid there may be trouble. There's the devil to pay when high school Hellcats and high school hotshots get together on an Anything Goes party. It was the scientific marvel of the century, a mighty juggernaut to blast through the solid rock of the Earth's mantle. At a rate of 78 feet per minute. 4,000 miles into the heart of our planet. We've been on top of the Earth long enough. It's about time we found out what's underneath. No Scottish. Listeners activating now. Steady the throttles. Ready? Oh, 
grand scale adventure from the world's favorite writer of fascinating fiction, Edgar Rice Burroughs at the Earth's Core, the astounding discovery of a strange, forbidding land. I've only seen it before in fossilized form. A primeval nightmare world whose shadows hid the nameless terrors that were yet to come. <laughs> Humans of another age, chained in bondage by an army of ape men, preyed upon by monstrous giants. the sly one will lead you well the ugly one back here i heard about him david he will kill you <laughs> behind a barrier of molten lava an empire of evil an inferno ruled by winged creatures like guardians of the gates of hell a host of satans nourished by the flesh of sacrificial maidens <laughs> Doug McClure, Peter Cushing, Caroline Monroe. Take the most terrifying journey of your life. Edgar Rice Burroughs at the Earth's Core.
young hiding you're early yes i'd finished up it was too late to start anything fresh what's all this fuss about in the papers tonight mr cabell wars and rumors of wars crying wolf someday the wolf will come these fools are capable of anything in that case what happens to medical research it has to stop that'll mess me up mess you up mess everything up my god if war gets loose again happy christmas everyone while shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground. What's the matter with you fellas? Oh, that. Huh. This little upset across the water doesn't mean anything. Threatened men live long and threatened wars never occur. <laughs> Another speech by him. I tell you, there's nothing in it. It's just to buck people up about the air estimates. Now, why meet wars halfway? Why not look on the bright side of things? You're all right. Your business is going up. Got a jolly wife, a pretty home. All's right with the world, eh? Mm. All's right with the world. Certainly. Passworthy, you should have been called Pippa Passworthy. Oh, and Cabal, you've been smoking too much. You're not, uh, you're not eupeptic. <laughs> oh, come on, it's Christmas. Noel, 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 Noel. Born is the king of Israel. Nice toys they have nowadays. Nice toys. The toys we had were simpler. Ever so much simpler. Noah's Ark and wooden soldiers. Nothing complex like these. You know, I wonder sometimes if perhaps all these new toys aren't a bit too much for them. It teaches them to use their hands. And I suppose their grandchildren will see even more wonderful things. Progress. Progress. I'd like to see the wonders they'll see. Don't be too sure of progress. Oh, listen to the incurable pessimist. What's to stop progress nowadays? War. Firstly, there isn't going to be a war. And secondly, war doesn't stop progress. It stimulates progress. Yes, war can be a highly stimulating thing. But you can overdo a stimulant. Oh, well, after all, I'll be exaggerating the horrors of war. Don't be rather overdo that song. After all, you know, the last war wasn't as bad as some people make out. We didn't worry. Something, something great seemed to have got hold of us. Something greater still may get hold of us next time. If we don't end war, war will end us. Well, what can you do? Yeah. What can we do? Goodwill to all men. <laughs> Real old-fashioned Christmas this year. Fresh little snow with a nip in the air, eh? What is that? Sounded like a gun. Oh, guns here. Merry Christmas, Cabell. Here's to another good year for all of us. Another year of recovery, eh? <laughs> what are searchlights doing now? Yes. Well, there must be anti-aircraft maneuvers. Maneuvers at Christmas? No. Listen, guns again. Yeah. The bell speaking. The hill down on Eldrone Street. Mobilization. Oh, God. Perhaps it's only precaution in mobilization. The unknown aircraft passed over Sea Beach and dropped bombs within a few hundred yards of the waterworks. They then turned seaward again. By this time, they'd been picked up with the searchlights of the battleship Dinosaur. Before they could mount out of range, she had opened upon them with her anti-aircraft guns. Unfortunately, without result. Of course, everyone has said this time they'll start without any declaration of war. Oh, listen. We do not yet know the nationality of these aircraft, though, of course, there could be little doubt of that place of origin. But before all things, it is necessary for the country to keep calm. No doubt the losses suffered by the fleet are serious. That losses of the fleet? Listen, listen. And it is imperative that the whole nation should at once stand to arms. Orders for a general mobilization have been issued, 
and the precautionary civilian organization against gas will at once be put into operation. Our instructions have just come to hand. We shall cut off for five minutes, and then read you the general instructions. Please call in all your friends. Call in everyone you can. You've got your stimulant, Parsworthy. Something great has got you. War has come. Sorry we had these children. No. Life must carry on. Why should we surrender life to the brutes and fools? I loved you. I wanted to serve you and, and make life happy for you. But think of the things that may happen to them. Were we selfish? You weren't afraid to bear them. We were children yesterday. We're anxious, but we're not afraid. Rip. <laughs> courage, my dear. And may that little heart have courage. Daddy? Well, you've got to do your bit, you know, sonny. You've got to do your bit. I'm an officer too, Daddy. <laughs> That's the spirit. Carry on, sir. Carry on. <laughs> Goodbye, son. There. Have it. Quick, Bob.
bad shape, eh? Why does it come to this? God, why do we have to murder each other? Go, my friend. That is my guess. It's a bad guess. Funny if I'm... if I'm killed by my own poison. Quick, get this... <coughs> I've given plenty to others. Why should I not have some myself? Give it to her. I'm done. <coughs> Bring through your mouth. <coughs> Guess on her. Maybe I've killed her father and mother. Maybe I've killed her whole family. <coughs> and then I go and give up my mask to save her. <coughs> that's that's funny. <coughs> that that's a joke. Very 
any more left, Father. This is the last drop. God. What is the use of trying to save this mad world? Oh, Father, if only you could get some sleep. How can I sleep? See how they wander out to die. That's how they dealt with the pestilence in the dark ages. Richard. Richard. My sister. Gone! How do you know? Her heart beats faster and she feels faint and she won't answer. What can I do for her? I thought something might be known. Oh, Janet. And you, you poor dear. Richard. I might be infected. There's nothing to make her comfortable. Nothing. There's nothing will make anyone comfortable anymore. the way to do it, shoot him. left in the place. We used the last on the other motor. Oh, what's the use? There's no petrol anywhere. I don't believe there's three gallons of petrol left in this accursed ruin of a town. What's the good of setting me at a job like this? Nothing will ever fly again. Flying's over. Everything's over. Civilization's dead.
the road, isn't it? Yes. It's a good pre-pestilence machine. I oil it and turn it over at times. You think it'll go fast someday, still? Oh, I'm not one of your petrol hoarders. But all the same, that engine turns over still. Why, I remember when I was a lad, when it was new, we thought nothing of going a hundred miles in it. A whole hundred miles. Less than three hours I've done it in. Oh, that sort of thing's all gone now. Gone forever, huh? That's right, sir. Yep, yep. Richard. What is it? You won't think me mad. Why, darling? I thought I heard an aeroplane this morning. At dawn. I thought it was a dream, but... Nonsense. I tell you, flying's finished. We shall never get in the air again. Never. Order. Give me only five. I don't want them all. And we'll end this war of ours forever. I'll see you get your reward. Your wife, Gordon? You keep her well hidden. Sanitation lady. You'll use your influence with our master mechanic. The combatant state wants his service. I'm sure my husband does his best for you. That's uh, hardly enough, lady. The combatant state demands miracles. Not everyone could work miracles as you do, Chief. Oh, I'm sure you could work miracles if you tried, lady. Rudolph! Lady, lady, I showed it to you, but you said you didn't want it. Watsky's been up to his tricks again, and he'll have to answer for them. But he's been keeping things back from me again. Only if Watsky keeps things back, what do you think of our master mechanic here? The one that may have those planes of mine to end this war of ours with the Hillman. Well, can't you make him? I thought you could make everybody do everything. Some things you can't do, madam. You can't fly without petrol. You've gone men machines without tools or materials. You've gone back too far. Flying's become a lost skill in every town. But are you really as stupid as that? I'm as helpless as that. And now, Chief, what are you going to do about it? He's going to let me have those machines, and I'm going to let him have coal. Stop to make oil. It's a lost skill. It's a dream of the... There it is. You were right. A plane once more. Mary, I must see that machine. Who's in control of this part of the country? The chief. What we call the boss. Good. I want to see him. He sent me to arrest you. You can't do that. But I'll come and see him. Well, you're under arrest whether you'll admit it or not. 
The country's in a state of war. Well, come along. I know the way. I remember this place well. I used to live over there for years. Ever heard of a man named Partworthy? Harding? Look, here he comes now. So you're hard. I seem to remember something about you. You were a young man. You're John Cabell. I remember you. I used to visit your house here endless years ago before the wars. You're still flying. Your hair is gray, but you look young enough. How are things here? Who's in control in this place? We have a chief, a warlord. The usual thing. I want to look up your warlord. Where can we go and talk? In my laboratory is the best thing. It's just over here. Right. <laughs> can't go in there. You're under arrest. You've got to go with me to the chief. All in good time. I must see this gentleman first. Well, you've got to go with me. Orders are orders. The boss first. Where is this man? Why isn't he brought here? Well, he's got up with Dr. Hardy. He has to be brought here. I must deal with him. Yeah, you can't go to him. That's impossible. He must come to you. Now send another man for him. Send three men. He's got to be brought here. So that's the sort of man your boss is. Not an unusual type. Everywhere we find these little semi-military upstarts robbing and fighting. That's what endless warfare has led to. Brigandage. What else could happen? But we, who are all that are left of the old engineers and mechanics, have pledged ourselves to salvage the world. We have the airways, all that's left of them. We have the seas. And we have ideas in common. The brotherhood of efficiency. The Freemasonry of science. We're the last trustees of civilization when everything else has failed. I've been waiting for this. I'm yours to command. Not mine. Not mine. No more bosses. Civilization's to command. Tell him he'll have to come. He won't come on foot. Well, we'll have to carry him. I don't know what'll happen to me, sir, if you don't come. Who are you? Do you know this country's at war? At war? Still at it, eh? We must clean that up. What do you mean, we must clean that up? All at war? Who are you, I say? The law. Law and sanity. I am the law here. I said law and sanity. Where do you come from? Who are you? Wings over the world. Well, you know you can't come into a country like this in this fashion? I'm here. Do you mind if I sit down? And now, for the fourth time, who are you? I tell you, wings over the world. That's nothing. What government do you under? Common sense. I belong to world communication. We just run ourselves. Yeah. You'll run into trouble if you try and land here in wartime. What's the game? Order and trade. Trade, eh? Can you do anything in munitions? Not our line of business. Fuel, spare parts, we've got planes, we've got planes. I've got boys that have trained a bit on the ground. We've no fuel, it hampers us. We might do a deal. We might. I know where I can get some fuel. I've got my plans later, but if you can manage a temporary accommodation, we'd do business. World communications helps no one to make war. End war, end war. I want to make victorious peace. I seem to have heard that phrase before, when I was a young man. But it made no end of war. Now, look here, Mr. Aviator. Let's see how we stand. Come down to actuality. The way you swagger, you don't seem to realize you're under arrest. You and your machine. You will find other planes looking for me if I happen to be delayed. We'll deal with them later. I even start a trading agency here, if you like. I have no objection. The first thing we shall want is to get our planes in the air again. Right. A laudable ambition. But our new order has an objection to private airplanes. The impudence. I'm not talking about private aeroplanes. Our aeroplanes are public aeroplanes. This is an independent, sovereign state at war. I know nothing about any old order. I'm the chief here, 
And I'm not taking any orders old or new from you. I suppose I've walked into trouble. Yeah, you can take that as right. Where have you come from? I flew from our headquarters at Basra this morning. We have some hundreds of new type planes and we're building more, fast. The factories are working again. We're gradually restoring order and trade in the whole Mediterranean area. We're scouting this region now to see how things are. You found out. This is an independent, sovereign state. Yes, we must talk about that. We don't discuss it. We don't approve of independent, sovereign states. You don't approve? We mean to stop them. That's war, if you will. All right, I think we know how we stand. Burton, take this man. If he gives you any trouble, club him. You hear that, Mr. Wings, over your wits? My friends know my whereabouts. If I don't come back, they'll send a force to find me. Perhaps they won't find you. They'll find you. They'll find me ready. Take him to the detention room downstairs. Now, was that wise? Wise? Yes, wise, to quarrel with him at once. Quarrel with him? Confound him, he began to quarrel with me. <laughs> you must clean that up. Clean that up? My wall. There's things behind him. Things behind him? Some sort of aerial bus driver standing up to me, like an equal. So you lost your temper and you bullied him. I don't bully, I just handle the man. He's the first real aviator that has come this way for years. Think of what that means, my dear. You want aeroplanes, don't you? You want your aeroplanes put in order? A really clever man could have had some of those machines up long ago. I'm sure of it. And along comes this stranger who's going to clean me up. You expect me to hand my planes over to him, lock, stock and barrel? Oh, I talk nonsense. You could have persuaded him under supervision. Supervision? It's all of oafs I've got here to supervise him. He'd be too much for them. Oh, well, of course, if it's going to be too much for you, why don't you hang him and hide his machine before the others are after you? I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. Now, this stranger hasn't taken me by surprise. I knew he was coming. Yes, I knew he was coming. I felt this conspiracy of air bus drivers brewing somewhere in the world. I felt they were getting ahead with their aeroplanes down there somewhere very well. Now's our chance. We've got this fella bottled up. They won't even begin to miss him for days. I've got everything fixed now for an attack straight away on the Floss Valley to the old coal and shale pits where there's oil too. Then, up we buzz. to say as any in the world. This new oil can be adapted to our needs. It's quite a simple business. Nothing remains but the conclusive bombing of the hills. Then for a time, we can hope for a rich, rewarding peace. A peace of the strong man armed who keepeth his heart. And now at this supreme crisis, you, Gordon, our master mechanic, refuse 
your help. Where are my slaves? The job's more difficult than you think. Parking machines are hopelessly old. You haven't 20 sound ones. To be exact, 19. You'll never get the others off the ground. The thing can't be done as you imagine it. I want assistance. What assistance? Your prisoner. Oh, do you want that chap in black that wings over the world? You want him released? He knows his business. I don't. Enough. Make him my technical advisor. I don't trust you technical chaps. Then you won't get an aeroplane up. I want those planes. Well, if you get it. Then I want Dr. Harding out, too. Where are those associates? I can't help that. If anybody in every town can adapt to that crude oil for our aeroplanes, it's Harding. If not, it can't be done. Oh, we had a bit of an argument with Harding. He's the only man who can do this work for you. Undo his hands. Well? Well what? The salute. Damn the salute. Sure. Yeah, no, no. Well, never mind the salute now. We'll talk about that later. Now, look here. Let's see how we stand. You, Gordon, are to undertake the reconstruction of our Air Force. The prisoner, Cabal, is to be placed at your disposal. Everywhere he goes, he is to be under guard and observation. No relaxing in there. Neither you nor he are to go within a hundred yards of his airplane. Mind that. Are you, Harding? to assist Gordon with this cure problem and place your knowledge of poison gas at our disposal. I have nothing to do with poison gas. You've got the knowledge of I have to wring it out of you. State your mother, your father, the totality of your interests. No discipline can be too severe for the man that denies that by word or deed. Nonsense. We have a duty to civilization. You and your sort are driving us straight back to eternal barbarism. But this is pure treason. I protest against being dragged away from my work. Confound your silly war and your war material and all the rest of it. All my life has been interrupted and wasted and spoiled by war. I am not standing any longer. But this is treason, treason, Captain. Stop that. We need of your service. Well, what do you want? You're conscripted. You're under my orders now and under no other orders in the world. I'm master here. I'm the state. I need fuel and gas. Neither fuel nor gas. You refuse? Absolutely. I don't want to be forced to extremities. May I have a word? I understand you want all of those out-of-date crocs of yours that you call your Air Force to fly again and fly well. They shall! With the help of that man, Cabell, you have in the cells, Dr. Harding here, and we even have a dozen of your planes in the air again. You! You're a traitor to civilization. I won't touch it! If you will give me a cabal, and if you leave me free to talk with Harding, I promise you you'll see your Air Force, a third of it at any rate, in the sky again. You talk as if you're driving a bargain with me. I'm sorry, Chief. It's not I who makes these conditions. This is the nature of things. You're going to have technical services, going to have scientific help without treating the men who give it to you properly. That's what I've said all along. No bullying too hard, my dear. There's a limit to bullying. You can't make a dog hunt by beating it. I want those planes. I wanted to look at you. I am at your service, madam. You're the most interesting thing that has happened in every town for years. You honor me. You come from outside. I've begun to forget there was anything outside. I want to hear about it. May I offer you my only chair? No, oh, I'm not a stupid woman. I'm sure. This life here is limited. War, always going on and never ending. Flags, marching. Oh, I adore the chief. I've always adored him since he took control in the pestilence days when everyone else lost heart. He rules. He's firm. Everyone. Every woman finds him strong and attractive. I can't complain. I have everything that is to be had here. And yet, this is a small, limited world we live in. You bring in the breath of something greater. When I saw you swooping down out of the air, when I saw you marching into the town hall, I felt this man lives in a greater world. And you spoke of the Mediterranean and the East, of your camps and factories. I've read about the Mediterranean, and Egypt, and Greece, and India. 
Oh, I can read. A lot of those old books. I'm not like most of the younger people here. I learned a lot before education stopped and school closed down. I want to see that world. Skies, snowy mountains, blue seas, sunshine, pines. If I had my way, you could fly to all that in a couple of hours. If you were free, and if I was free, I don't suppose any man has ever understood any woman since the beginning of things. You don't understand our imagination, how wild our imaginations can be. I wish I were a man. Oh, if I were a man. What are your people trying to do to us? What are you going to do to this boss of mine? The immediate question seems, what does he mean to do to me? Something violent and foolish. Unless I prevent it. That's how I see things. And if he kills you? We shall come here and clean things up. But if you're killed, how can you say we? We go on. That's how things are. We are taking hold of things. In science and government in the long run, no man is indispensable. The human things go on. We, forever. I see. And this warlike state of ours here. It has to vanish, like the Tyrannosaurus and the saber-toothed tiger. Oh, so here you are. I said I should talk to him, and I have. I told you to leave that fellow alone. Yes, and sat up there blinking and swaggering and looking as proud as you could, Rudolph the Victorious. And here am I trying to find out what this black invader means. You think I wanted to come and talk to him? This gray, cold man? While you're swaggering here, there are more flames away there at Basra getting ready. Basra? His headquarters. Have you never heard of Basra? These are matters for us to talk about. This lady has been putting me through a severe cross-examination. But the gist of it is that away there in Basra, new airplanes are rising night and day, like hornets round a hornet's nest. What happens to me is a small affair. They'll finish you. The new world of United Airmen will finish you. Listen, you can almost hear them coming now. Not a bit of it. What he says is the truth. What he says is bluff. Make peace with the Airmen and let him go. That means surrender of our sovereign independence. But more machines will be coming and more and more. And he's here, hostage for their good behavior. Come, madam, enough of this little diplomatic mission of yours. You've got the subtlety of a bullfrog. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what she's been saying to you. I don't much care. There's no making peace between you and me. It's your world or mine, and it's going to be mine. With all your threats of swarms of hornets and so on, you're a hostage, remember that. Don't be too sure you win. Just sit here and think that over, Mr. Wings over the world. Now get round to the other side and look at these engine bear abrasions quickly. I could get to my plane as a wireless there. Hope Mr. won't even trust me. We shall have to make a job of this. If you manage to get your reserve petrol, let me have that for this plane. Good. It won't be easy to make a getaway. These oil pump connections aren't very good, but we'll have to risk it. I think we'll manage it all right now that Harding knows his part of the job. Good. Where do you come from? 
come from the north. America. Yes, Cabal is a prisoner. They've got him done. He's in danger. I had great difficulty in getting here. You say Cabal is in danger? In very great danger. The boss there is a violent tough. Job for our new squadron. Well, now we've got a chance to try the new gas of peace on somebody. There's no time to lose, sir. May I report to headquarters? Yes. Take him to the council. At last, we have definite news. What is it? Gordon didn't fall into the sea. He got away. A fishing boat saw him making for the French coast. Perhaps he reached his pal. Well... Well, he'll be coming back. He'll be bringing the others with him. Curse these world communications. Curse all airmen and gasmen and machine men. Why didn't we leave their machines and their sciences alone? I might have known. Why did I tamper with flying? Well, we needed airplanes against the hill states. Somebody else would have started in again with airplanes and gas and bombs if we hadn't. These people would have come interfering anyhow. Why was all this science ever allowed? Why was it ever let begin? Science is an enemy of everything that's natural in life. I dreamt of those fellows last night, great, ugly, black, inhuman chaps. Oh, like machines, bombing and bombing. Yes, I guess they'll come bombing all right. Then we'll fight them. Since Gordon got away, I've had those air boys up to see me. They've got guts. They'll do something still. We'll fight them. We'll fight them. Sir, we've got hostages. And they didn't shoot them anyway. It was that chap Harding. Of course. He can't tell us what to do against this gas. If I had to pull his arm off and knock his teeth down his throat. Get him. Get him. Get him. Get him. I have to come to Earth sometime. What is this world communications? A handful of men like ourselves. They're not magic. Well, communication people, have they got gas? What sort of gas? I know nothing about gas. Tell us about these masks, anyway. Well, they're rotten. They're no good at all. What sort of gas have they got? I tell you, gas isn't my business. Well, they can't gas us when you are here, anyway. Here they are. Listen, they're coming already.
up with the rest of our fellas. Go on. I'll back him. They're both coming down, cowards. But they can't suggest that we have hostages. The hostages? I'm not done yet. Go on, Pinter, bring them out here, out in the open, tie them up where they can be seen. Where's the other fellow? He's the prize hostage. He's the best of the lot. They'll know him. Pitch him, pitch him. Look. Is that gas? I saved your father and I saved you. Couldn't you call up your man there to stop this? I won't have it like this. What's happening? Everything's swimming. Shoot! Shoot! We never shot enough yet! We never shot enough! We spared them now they've got us. Oh, we'll <laughs> Why should I be beat like this? Shoot! Shoot! No, no, she's not hurt. She's like the others. Cabell, safe! Cabell! Well done, Gordon! Well, they laughed at me for sticking to my gas mask. But thanks to that, I'm here and everyone else is sleeping. I wonder if they'll ever use gas masks again. Sir! What is it? This man's not sleeping. He's dead. Dead in his world, dead with him, and a new world beginning. Poor old Fox, he and his flags and his folly. And now for the rule of the earth, and a new life for mankind. <laughs> We have the unity of a common order and a common knowledge. This is how I conceive our plan of operation. First, the roundup of brigands. At last, dismal vestige of ancient predatory soldiers. The last would-be conquerors. Then settle, organize, advance. This zone, then that. And at last, wings over the world. And the new world begins. Do you realize the immense task we shall undertake? When we set ourselves to an active and aggressive peace. When we direct our energies to tear out the wealth of this planet. And exploit all these 
giant possibilities of science that have been squandered hitherto upon war and senseless competition. We shall excavate the eternal hills. We shall make such use of the treasures of sky and sea and earth as men have never dreamt of hitherto. I would that I could see our children's children in this world we shall win for them. But in them and through them, we shall live again.
is in a better world than it used to be. I rebel against this progress. What has this progress, this world civilization done for us? Machines and marbles. They've built these great cities of theirs, yes. They've prolonged life, yes. They've conquered nature, they say, and made a great white world. Is it any jollier than the world used to be in the good old days, when life was short and hot and merry and the devil took the hindmost? All the same, what can we do about it? Rebel. And rebel now, now, now is the time. Why now in particular? Why, because of this space gun business. Because of this project to shoot human beings at the stars. People don't like it, shooting humans away into hard, frozen darkness. They're murmuring. They've murmured before and nothing came of it. Because they had no leader. Now, suppose someone cried, Halt! Stop this progress! Suppose I shouted to the world, Make an end to this progress. I could talk, talk. Radio is everywhere. This modern world is full of voices. I'm a master craftsman. I have the right to talk. Yes, but will they listen to you? They'll listen, trust them. If I shout, Arise! Awake! Stop this progress before it is too late! like that in the old days. Why? They'd no light inside their cities as we have, so they had to stick them up into the daylight, what there was of it. They'd no properly mixed and conditioned air. Everybody lives half out of doors. <coughs> they have windows and ripples last. The age of windows lasted four centuries. They never seemed to realize that we could light the interiors of our houses with sunshine of our own. So there was no need to stick them up ever so high into the air. They keep on inventing new things now, don't they? And making life lovelier and lovelier. Lovelier, yes. And bolder. I suppose I'm an old man, my dear, but some of it seems like going too far. This space gun of theirs that they keep on shooting. Yes, this space gun, great grandfather. Well, it's a gun that is charged by electricity. It's a lot of guns inside one another, and each one discharges the gun next inside. I don't properly understand it, but the cylinder it shoots out last goes swish right away from the earth. I wish I could fly around the moon. <laughs> well, that in time. Won't you come back to your history pictures again? I'm glad I didn't live in the old world. I know that John Cabal and his airmen tidied it all up. Did you see John Cabal, Great Granddad? Well, you can see him in your pictures. You saw him when he lived. You really saw him? Yes. I saw the great John Cabell with my own eyes when I was a little boy. He was a lean, brown old man with hair as white as mine. He was the great-grandfather of our Oswald Cabell, the president of our council. I take it the space guns passed all its preliminary trials, and there's nothing left now but to choose the two who are to go. That's going to be the trouble. Thousands of young people have been applying, young men and young women. I never dreamt the moon was so attractive. Practically, the gun's perfect now. There are risks, but reasonable risks. And the position of the moon in the next three or four months gives us the best conditions for getting there. It's only the, the choice of the two now that matters. Well, there are going to be difficulties. That man Theotokopoulos is talking on the radio about it. He's a fantastic fellow. Yes, but he's making trouble. It's not going to be easy to choose these young people. With all these thousands offering themselves, we've looked into thousands of cases. We've rejected everyone who's in perfect health, or anyone who had friends who objected. And the fact is, we want you to talk to two people. There's Raymond Parsworthy of General Fabric. You know him? Yes, I know him. And his son. We want you to see the son, Maurice Parsworthy. Why? He asks to go. We think you ought to see him. He's waiting here. 
Is Morris Parsworthy there? He's on his way. Good. You want to talk to me? Forgive me, sir. I came straight to you. You're asking a favor? A very big favor. I want to be one of the first two human beings to go around the moon. It means danger. Great hardship, anyhow. You realize there's an even chance of never coming back alive. A still greater chance of coming back a cripple. Give me credit for not minding that, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of you young people don't mind that. But why should I give you a favor? Well, I... I'm the son of a friend of yours, and uh, people seem to feel you wouldn't to send someone you don't know, sir. Go on. We've talked about this over and over again. We? Yes, both of us. It's her idea even more than it's mine. Her idea? Who is she? Someone much closer to you than I am, sir. Go on. It's Catherine, your daughter. She says you can't possibly send anybody's child but your own. I might have known. Today I'm going to put it to the world plainly. Is this thing to go on? Or are we sane and normal human beings to put an end to it? And an end to all such follies forever? What is this progress? What is the good of all this progress onward and onward? We demand a halt. We demand a rest. The object of life is happy living. We will not have human life sacrificed to experiment. Progress is not living. It will only be the preparation for living. They stage the old Greek tragedy again. And a father offers up his daughter to his evil god. And that they voice is sounding to the whole world. No. The old slaveries have taken new yeah. names. And They'll have to hear him and make what they can of him. What does this space gun portend? Make no mistake about it. The slaveries they put upon themselves today, they will impose tomorrow upon the whole world. Is man never to rest, never to be free? A time will come when you in your turn will be forced to wait to take your chance upon strange planets and in dreary, abominable places beyond the stars. Make an end to this progress now. Let this be the last day of the scientific age. Make the space come the symbol of all that drives us and destroy it now. I wonder what they will make. Great grandson of John Gabal, the air dictator, the man who changed the whole course of the world. You, you've got experiments in your blood, you and your daughter. But I'm, I'm more normal. I don't believe my boy would have thought of it. The two of them must have got together. They'll come back together. This time, there's no attempt to land on the moon. When, when is this great experiment to be made? How much longer have we got before they go? When the space gun is ready. Sometime this year, do you mean? Soon. Then, is there no way of saving our children from this madness? But would it be saving our children? Well, here they are. Father, where to go? Yes, you're to go. It's announced. Two hours ago. <laughs> Your speech has struck fire. All the people are excited and angry. Some are already going out of the city towards the space gun. Nothing is wanted now but deeding. We must go right on with this. To the space gun! And so we end an age. Young people, just beginning life. You want to go into that outer horror. Why don't you send somebody who's sick of life? 
They want fit young people, alert and quick. And we're fit young people. We can observe and come back and tell. Cabal, I just want to ask you one plain question. Why did you let your daughter dream of going on this mad moon journey? Because I love her. And I want her to live to the best effect. Dragging out life to the last possible second is not living to the best effect. The nearer the phone, the sweeter the meat. The best of life, Passworthy, lies nearest to the edge of death. I'm a broken man. I don't know where honor lies. You haven't got things right, Passworthy. Our fathers and our fathers' fathers cleaned up the old order of things because it killed children. It killed those who were unprepared for death. Because it tormented people in vain. Because it outraged human pride and dignity. Because it was an ugly spectacle of waste. But that was only a beginning. There's nothing wrong in suffering if you suffer for a purpose. Our revolution didn't abolish danger or death. It simply made danger and death worthwhile. Cabal. Cabal, the gun's in urgent danger. It's a race against time now to save it. Theodor Copulus is up with a crowd of people already. He's going to the space gun now. They're going to break it up. They say it's the symbol of your tyranny. And their weapon? Bars of metal. They can smash delicate apparatus. They can do endless mischief. But you have a traffic control. Can't they produce the police? Very few. We've nothing but the gas of peace, and it isn't ready. It'll take hours yet. We must hold this crowd back at any cost for a time until the gas of peace is ready. Is this? Well, we've stopped the airways. They'll have to go afoot. And they'll take an hour or more to get there, even those who've already started. This gun mustn't have broken up. After all the final experiments have been made, when everything was ready... When everything was ready? If they smash up that infernal gun, then honor is satisfied and you needn't go. They won't smash the gun. Suppose the gun was fired now. Would the cylinder reach the moon? It would miss and fly into outer space. It's five now. If the gun were fired before seven... And it could be. Yes. Then... We go now. No, no, no. I don't know what to say, but don't go, don't go. Oh, but, Father, we must go now, or we may never go. And then for the rest of our lives, we'll feel we've shirked and lived in vain. We must go now. Quickly, this way.
you go up to the platform, we'll guard this below. Right. Contract all your muscles when the concussion comes. In five minutes, you'll be able to get loose and move about.
there they go. That faint gleam of light. I feel that what we've done is monstrous. What they've done is magnificent. Will they come back? Yes. And go again and again. Till the landing is made and the moon is conquered. This is only a beginning. If they don't come back, my son and your daughter, what of that, Cabal? Then presently others will go. Oh, God, is there never to be any age of happiness? Is there never to be any rest? Rest enough for the individual man. Too much, too soon, and we call it death. But for man, no rest and no ending. He must go on, conquest beyond conquest. First, this little planet and its winds and waves. And then all the laws of mind and matter that restrain it. Then the planets about it. And at last, out across immensity to the stars. And when he has conquered all the deeps of space and all the mysteries of time, still he will be beginning. We're such little creatures. Poor oh, humanity is so fragile, so weak. Little, little animals. Little animals. And if we're no more than animals, we must snatch each little scrap of happiness and live and suffer and part. Mattering no more than all the other animals do or have them. It is this or that. All the universe or nothing. Which shall it be? Which shall it be? Visit us often and enjoy our screen attractions in the comfort of your own car. Get the drift. We feature ice-cold drinks at our concession. Hurry, 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 folks. Get your crunchy, chewy, chocolatey candy bars now at the concession stand. Our pizza pies, made from a famous Italian recipe. They're waiting for you at the concession stand. Yes, sir, the hot dogs at our concession stand do rate an appreciative whistle.
Ice Cream Bars. It's the handy way to enjoy smooth, rich, creamy ice cream. Get some. is prepared especially for you. Try our delicious hamburgers. Come and get them at the concession stand. It's Pepsi for those who think young. Think young. Say Pepsi, please. I eat popcorn. Everybody eats popcorn. She tastes real nice. Get yourself some now at our refreshment stand. The best defense against candy hunger is a counterattack. Plenty of time to come and be served at the refreshment center before showtime.
get more out of life. Come often and bring your family to our drive-in theater. There's plenty of time to treat yourself to something good to eat at our refreshment center. Visit us often and enjoy our screen attractions in the comfort of your own car. That's my mom, man. My keys. Daddy, Johnny used to say that we used to have a swing set in the backyard. What happened to it? Matthew, how many times do I have to tell you Johnny is not real? You keep making him up in your head. But he is real. Jonathan! Matthew Jonathan Watkins. Okay, I am tired of hearing about this. This is the last time. Do you understand me? Go to your room. Hmm. 
I just saw Johnny by the bathroom. He said, he said it wasn't my fault. You know, Aaliyah, I don't know what it is with you. First you're hearing things, now you're seeing things. I swear to you, if you keep talking like this, I will lock you up in a mental institution and I will leave you there with all the crazy people. You understand me? Matt. 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 What's wrong with you? Johnny. Who? That's Johnny. This won't take long. Are you sure you don't want me to come with? Yeah, just wait here. All right, be here. Want some breakfast? No thanks. How does any about grandma's place? How's the old house holding up? It's looking pretty good. Just needs some cleaning up. Oh. I was looking through storage and well, I found this. Who's that boy, Dad? Uh that's your mom and Alex, a neighbor kid. Read the back, Dad. Leah, mm, Johnny. No, this can't be right. That's Alex, the neighbor's kid. He was sick. He looks a lot like my friend Johnny. You remember him? Your imaginary friend? Yeah. I had a weird dream last night, and somebody was drowning me in a bathtub. Now you're starting to sound like Mom. And I told you never to speak that name in this house. Yeah, I'm not crazy. Stop acting like it. I'm gonna prove to you that Johnny is real. Matt, you're not six anymore. Grow up. What happened? He thinks I'm crazy. So? Your dad never believed in any of that stuff anyway. I just don't understand why I had to go and tell him about all that. I just want to see if you knew who that kid was. He said his name was Alex. I think he's hiding something. What's this meeting all about? Who's this? Remember Johnny? Your imaginary friend. Yeah. What about him? That's him, right there. It's impossible. You're kidding, right? You know, 
don't think your mom. I don't know. Remember when we were kids? We used to feel really safe when he was around. This time it's different. I feel like he wants me to do something. Hang on. Let me pull up the police archives. Here's the file. This boy disappeared. Parents were suspected, but they didn't have enough evidence. Look at the names. We gotta get to the bottom of this. So how do you know your dad's not gonna be home tonight? Every Friday night he's been leaving. He goes to the bars. He doesn't come home till one or two. And are you sure about this? Yeah, look, there he goes. Right on time. So where should we start looking first? Well, I had a dream, and there's a swing set right over there. There were bones underneath that. Do you really think he's buried in the backyard? Ugh, who would do such a thing? We are trying to contact a little boy named Johnny. Are you with us? Johnny, are you here? If you can hear us, talk to us. Okay, let's go look over here. Leah, what happened? He's my brother. Oh. He killed him. He... Who? Your dad? Are you saying your dad killed him? Oh. He let my mom take all the blame. That's why she lost it. Oh my god. We need to go. I'm gonna lie, Dad. Tell me about Johnny. You made him up. He was all in your head. 
Jonathan Matthew Watkins, born February 5th, 1979, disappeared December 20th, 1984. I don't know what you're you talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You killed him. You, you, you blamed it on Mom. You made her think it was her fault. You bury him in the backyard, and, and you report him missing? I didn't. I, I... Why did you kill him? I didn't do it. You ruined her life. I thought you said you loved her. I do Why did you do it? He was sick. He was sick. I couldn't go through life knowing that he'd be suffering for the rest of his. And it was making your mother sad. I had to. For all of us. What about mom? It looked like an accident. I wanted to make her happy. So you lock her in a mental institute? No one else can know about this. I had to shut her up. Are you gonna kill me now? Freeze! Drop the knife, Bill. Get on the ground. Bill, you are under arrest under the charge of murder. Anything you say will be used against you in a court of law. You got him? Yeah, I got him. Get up. Get up. Are you okay? I think so. Come on, move. she doing? She hasn't eaten in three days. And she's refusing all medication. I don't think she's going to last much longer. saw Johnny. He showed me what happened. He wanted me to tell you something. It wasn't your fault, Mom. Dad drowned him. He let you take the blame. Johnny wanted me to set things right. Dad's in jail now. Johnny.
Théâtre, la forme d'un bout, présentationnel, la Corrivo. An old French Canadian tale, a true tale that is, about a series of peculiar deaths that plagued the small village of saint Valier, Quebec, between the years 1749 and 1760. saint Valier was a God-fearing settlement nestled between the more prominent town of St. Joseph de Levy and the picturesque riverbanks of Lille d'Orléans, the Isle of Orleans. Colonized in the name of His Majesty the King of France, largely by Catholic missionaries and Jesuit priests, the people of St. Valier were accustomed to a quiet, pious lifestyle. But never would they, could they imagine the devil among them. Ah, but already I've said too much. Instead, mesdames and messieurs, I invite, no, I implore you to see with your own eyes and say after la somnambule, lift the veils of time and affected memory, the evil that lies in a woman's heart. Mesdames and messieurs, je vous présente la corribo. Stop. 
moon. These walls have eyes that record my deeds and prophesy my fate, and ears that hear my prayers but offer no absolution, and tongues that spit out my jugement final in their endless recounting of my past. They accuse me of walking hand in hand with Lucifer himself. They would not believe me that I had no such knowledge of the divine, nor do I make it my acquaintance. My sins, my desires, they are carnal. The shadows of my deeds are pale shadows to me now, pale only as moonlight is pale, visible to all. Perhaps you see it too. You there, what do you see? Have my eyes, these rumored bewitching treasures of Satan, have they become so transparent? Or perhaps you are only curious. Perhaps you have had these thoughts too, that sinister ache for freedom, that desire to sever the ties that bind you, to tear your invisible strings from heaven and fall to hell in the execution of one perfect, pure act of free will. Do you wonder what lies on the other side? Then I am only too happy to indulge you. But listen closely, my dear friends, for they will come for me soon. And then, when the heavy weight of rumors buries my story deep into the ground with my bones, you alone will be a witness to my tale. sleep. Peace. Ah, peace. I am none. In the waking world, I learned to loathe him quickly. Charles Bouchard, the exemplary citizen, the true patriot, who in actuality was a poor lover and a weak character. An average man. But a fine match, so said my papa. I was called La Belle des Belles de Dix Parois à la Ronde, the beauty of beauties of ten surrounding parishes, and we were married in the spring of 1749 in the Chapelle de la Vierge, under the glorious ringing of a new church bell, recently imported from France. In the waking world, he made up for mediocrity the way most do, working hard, dependably, a source of basic material provisions and material stability for myself and our future children. And in four years of marriage, there was nothing remarkable nor unusual about our union, save the lack of tiny rosy cheeks and fine long heads in our own. We had yet to have a child. There was no choice. I was never giving one. And so I exercised my will in keeping Charles out of my bed. I did not understand there was a real choice I might make. But in time, I began to. In the way he suffered and collapsed under a fever that spread through our village the first winter we were together. In the rigidity of his bones, where his wrist once cracked upon a nasty fall. In the fragility of his life. It was in his peaceful sleep that I stood quietly by the fire, melting down the lead piping that ran through our home. And in his peaceful sleep that I poured thick black liquid gently into our slender spouted kettle. It was in his peaceful sleep that I crept nocturnal to the bed where his last breaths were rising in unison to his naked midnight breathing voice. And in his peaceful sleep that I poured the lead into his ear and stood as witness as his eyes shot open, filling with shock for one brief moment before the lead settled to his brain. <laughs> And so you see I lied, for he was quite awake when he died. After this, it all became dreadfully clear to me how dreadful, dreadful life could be 
and the decisions that we make. They suspected art failure and called me la jeune veuve, the young widow. As a result, I accepted much pity and a second marriage proposal for the following winter. The earnestness of my acceptance, I have trouble discerning now. I believe I tried, tried to be a good wife, to be a Christian, to comply with my fate. He tried to kind-hearted Louis, but his kindness was only fuel to my fire. I had exchanged my freedom for small, amorous tokens and found myself bound to the limits of his making. So I bound him up instead, slipping a tasteless, odorless poison into his nightcap, which immediately began to twist and tighten his muscles in the most unnatural way. And then, when he lay on the floor, infantile and helpless, I tied his gnarled limbs hard to his body and left him to die through the night. Except that he didn't. For when I woke in the morning, the poison had permanently ravaged his muscles and nerves, but had failed to provide him with the relief of death. His eyes stared widely at me with fear or anger, which when I could not be sure. I felt a weakness in me. My only option was to end his suffering, and I could not take it. Instead, I left him for six more mornings through fits of restless sleep and waking, made more severe by extreme hunger and thirst, until, on the seventh day, like God, he rested. Acute dehydration was determined as his cause of death, and I informed the authorities that Louis had been bedded and feverish for several nights. I was changed. With resolve and momentum, I had made my decisions. I took a third husband after pretending a reasonable amount of grief and arranged for him to meet his fate in the barn with one swift blow of a shovel to his head. Where is this God, I would cry in public, who would take my two loves in their sleep and allow a third to be taken at the foot of a wretched new? For the authorities had surmised he had suffered a blow to the head, most likely the kick of a mule due to the location of his fall. I had no shortage of admirers at this point. For every gossip and item down, there was a good art at Lancelot, unwilling to believe the rumors, believing I was the tragic beauty, sad and sweet, and fallen upon disturbing misfortune. I chose the blacksmith Roger and roasted him by way of gasoline as he slept at night. Though again, I am quite sure he woke up to meet his maker. Then came Jean-Pierre who pleaded that we move to the Grand Fort City, La Ville de Québec, to start anew, far away from the suspicions of a small-minded village. There, I would bear him children, four, possibly five, and he would provide for us with his keen sense of business and finance. I agreed, all the while knowing I would not leave my home, my papa, my lineage, all the while knowing I had no intention of bearing this man children, creating some perverse dilution of myself which could never possibly match the original. And one afternoon, as Jean-Pierre daydreamed of our escape by the river beyond our home, I clubbed him with a fallen branch and sent him to a watery grave. Sadly, after Jean-Pierre's death, my courtiers began to drop off. The almost certain outcome of a union with myself was more than they were willing to risk. Gossip in saint Valier run rampant, and my papa spent sleepless nights worrying about the latest rumors which spoke of outside authorities, British authorities, and court marshals. Still, through much perseverance and charm on my part, I was preparing to wed a wandering man, Le Monsieur Daniel Leclerc, who had acquaintances and knew little of my past. I sat one night, reworking the stitching on my wedding dress, when a knock on the door altered my plans. Miss Corbeau, open the door immediately. This is Inspector Wellington on behalf of the British Regiment. What is it, Inspector? Please, won't you come in? No time for that, Miss Corbeau. I'm placing you under arrest for the murders of Charles Bruchard, Louis Darnier, Philip Bidard, Ivan Rogers, Jean-Pierre Galland. Come with me, Mrs. Corbeau. Justice is awaiting you. Please, stand what is wrong?
kept me in a small, dark cell as they mounted the case against me. Bodies were exhumed. Progressive coroners and British officers were brought in to collect evidence. In daytime, I was visited often by my papa in unwavering sympathy and the priest, Le Père Clapillon, who implored me to confess my sins to God in order that I might receive some absolution in the next world. At night, I had only the ghostly, ravaged spirits of my dead husbands to keep me company. It was only a moment between the time I felt the scalding hot liquid in my ear and when it reached my brain. Only a moment to look one last time upon my world, my wife, and to understand what was happening. But I shall spend my eternity in that moment, feeling my senses extinguished one by one, my eyes the only accusation to my lover. Plum, lead, plum liquid, liquid lead. This is all that defines me in death. Poison worked its way through my veins throughout the night, swelling tiny blood vessels with its venom, atrophying my muscles and twisting my limbs. I thought I shall never feel such pain again in all my life, and as I endure, I shall take some comfort in that. However, over the next several days, the piercing hunger that threw me into fits of bilious vomiting, the excruciating thirst that left my throat cracked and dry, the abrasive cord, Bound by my lover that slowly wore through my skin, deep into already aching, gnarled muscles. These all combined to produce a pain far worse than the act of being poisoned. Forget that I was once known as Louis Dodier. Louis with the kind heart. Call me only Doc Sick, for now my heart as well as my body are poison. Call him all you witch! This you should have been better than life. Not I. I would have you die on this stake filling the shock of the heat as your flesh is torched, which gives way to the searing pain of skin and vital organs reduced to ash. Did you know that I smelled my own body burn? Smelled it like cooking meat, Corivo, as I prayed for quick death. Je suis brûlé. Burnt. God sees me now, Corivo, and he sees you through my eyes. Je suis traumatisme, trauma of the head, the result of a blunt force to the skull and subsequently brain. The mule that struck me down was my wife, but it was not in actuality the force of the blow which killed me. Brave though it was, I might have survived the act had I been able to lift my head out of the pool of blood that quickly filled beneath it and swelled my lungs with its suffocating life. In my last precious moments, I thought lovingly of my parents, of Massa, my sister, Emily, and her three darling children. And I thought too of my wife, with some mixed emotions. I had a dream, for my wife and I. I would take her away from all this suspicion and hatred and misunderstanding that surrounded her. I would use all my resources, all my facilities to provide her with a chance, some hope. I dreamed she would be the mother of my children. Oh, such sweet children they would have been. I dreamed I would wake in the morning to see the sunshine reflected in her pale skin and dark eyes. And she would sit by the window, feeding our child. And it was as I dreamed these dreams that she snuck up from behind, wielding a large fallen branch as I turned around to quit her. Je suis noi, drowned as I was, for making the fatal mistake of loving La Corivo.